Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of ABFM Interviews. Today, I'm going to be talking with the one and only Judgy Bitch, also known as Janet Bloomfield, who has managed to do something that I've never managed to do. She's gotten herself banned from Twitter a couple of times. Uh, first of all, just Janet, just say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me with the uh, patriarchal overlord himself. Great honor. I love being recognized by the patriarchy in this way. Thank you. The honor is totally mine. Um, well, let's get started with the basics. Um, one, we, we all know that feminists are by nature censors. Uh, we know that from fire alarm pulling. We know that from near riots. We know that from uh, media people spreading lies and um, distorting the truth and from accounts being suspended left and right but somehow JB managed to get her Twitter account suspended twice and I mean like I think within 48 hours 24 hours of each other what would, so let's let's break it down into two parts let's talk about the first time that you were in such egregious violation of Twitter community standards that you had to be ousted. What happened with that? Well, I was, I will confess, I was pushing the boundaries of Twitter. I was pushing the limits. I was live tweeting um, the construction of a wedding cake. <gasps> a wedding cake? It's well, true. It was a wedding cake, yes. and. Um, it was it was kind of a it ended up being an absolutely hilarious episode because in the middle of baking a wedding cake for 250 people my husband broke my stove <laughs> like he shattered it he just destroyed it but uh, what really i sort of made a joke out of it that i got i got banned from twitter for making a wedding cake in all honesty i think what happened is that richard dawkins the richard dawkins retweeted me out to a million people that followed my, people say harassment. I don't think it's particularly harassing to take some dumb bitch wearing a I bathe in male tears t-shirt and spread that out far and wide so she can answer it. Answer for that. Being held accountable is not harassment. So between Jessica Valente and Richard Dawkins, all of a sudden, all of this media was being reported as abusive and it triggered an automatic suspension. I got no reason for it. I got no warnings. It wasn't about trolling. It wasn't about um, responding to people or being abusive in how I respond. If you do that, you will get a warning from Twitter saying, here are the rules. Please don't violate them. And um, you need to agree to that. And that didn't happen for me. It was just, boom, an automatic suspension. So I went and started the second account, and again, um, I was just absolutely brigaded images. The image that was being reported for abuse was the comparison between Ray Rice and that chick in England um, who admitted that she punched her boyfriends in the face a couple times and laughed about it, and this media was being reported as abusive, and again, boom, the account was suspended. So I got the third one up, and in the meantime, Twitter came back to me, didn't give me a reason, just said, your account is unsuspended. Okay. Well, let's for to clarify for folks, if you don't know, if you've been under a rock somewhere, uh, there was a photograph that Jessica Valenti obviously posed for with her standing on a beach with her arms spread out uh, in glory, wearing a shirt that says, I bathe in male tears. Um, I think that they realized, she in particular realized, uh, after that uh, image was released and, you know, there was a lot of people that just tweeted that image with no comment because it didn't need any comment. I mean, somebody that would wear a shirt advertising and bragging about the fact that they enjoy the suffering of other human beings um, speaks for itself. Uh, and there was a lot of a lot of stir about that. Uh, but again, going back to what Janet said, think about this. She was only tweeting about a wedding cake. Oh, I saw the cake, by the way. It was absolutely a work of art. It was beautiful. Like I could have eaten the picture. It was so good looking. But so you got no reason 
just that your account was suspended after tweeting pictures of a wedding cake, which feminist do you think you pissed off? Or did you piss off all of them? Oh, I think it was Jessica Valente. Without a doubt, it was Jessica Valente. I, perhaps this is arrogant of me, but I honestly don't think so. That I relentlessly disseminated that photograph out as far and wide as I could, prompting Amanda Hess to write a defense of Jessica over at Slate.com. Um, she wrote, you know, the piece about ironic misandry, that, oh, it's just kind of funny. So I suppose I bathe in Palestinian tears. It's just some ironic Islamophobic. I don't know. I mean, the, the argument is just ridiculous that it's okay to make fun of an entire group of people, half of humanity suffering, because it's just ironic. It's fun. But I honestly think that it was me her, getting that picture out there, harassing Jessica, that prompted Amanda to write that. And of course, Amanda Hess works closely with Amanda Marcotte. And I have spanked Amanda Marcotte quite a lot. Um, but it takes someone with a large group of followers, like Jessica Valenti. She's got 60,000 followers on her Twitter feed. So it would take a large group of them to simply decide to report this image for abuse to trigger that suspension. And I think that's, that's the person who has the largest following that got really embarrassed, that was held accountable for something despicable that she did. And I actually think Jessica's probably in a little bit of shock that she was held brought to task for that. I have no doubt. Uh, by the way, uh, Amanda Hess is an old buddy of mine. She and I go way back uh, during the Hofstra false accusation fiasco that happened. I wrote an article for Men's News Daily questioning the sensibility of some so, of a woman that might fuck five guys on the bathroom floor of a college. Um, and she took great offense to that. And uh, But, but we're chums nonetheless, right? But uh, I would not be surprised. A lot of this stuff goes into brigading, like you brought up earlier. Uh, I think that these little bitches get together in their little covens and they talk about who they're going to go after. I do think, uh, and I think they're right about it, that feminist ideologues like Amanda Hess, like uh, Amanda Marcotte, uh, like Jessica Valenti, really see women who are speaking up against feminism as the biggest threat. I remember that Valenti uh, actually took her lazy ass off the beach during vacation. She was so outraged about the women against feminism hashtag that she stopped her privileged little vacation to write an article about it in protest. So I'm, I gotta say, I think that's why they're going after you. Now to the second one, um, I got to wonder why not a third? Why aren't they continuing the attack? Why not just obliterate you uh, from the face of Twitter? Well, because they can't. Um, I was contacted by a female computer programmer, programmer, someone who works at Twitter, which is absolutely fantastic. And she gave me very explicit instructions on how the Twitter algorithm works what it is that it's looking to detect and how you stay out of the Twitter gulag. What you can do, very, very simple little actions you can take to avoid triggering their algorithm. It's actually beautifully simple and for anyone who is consistently getting suspended on Twitter, if you just PM me, I will share that information with you. I'm not going to pop it up here because I don't need a bunch of little trolls learning how to come and clog up my feed. Um, I, ha I, have enough, I have enough problems with the disabled on my feed already. It's just, it's, it gets a little bit carried away at times. But I, I just thought that was absolutely amazing that it was a woman who came to me and said, listen, this is how you do Twitter to avoid getting suspended. And now that I know how to do it, I see it everywhere. I see all the people who understand what they're, how, how to get around this. The, the fact that an image, if it was the wedding cake perhaps, they picked an image for sure to be reported as abuse. Um, the fact that a human being got involved at Twitter, reviewed the account and said this is nonsense. Now any other, um, any other 
I've been red flagged. So now a human being is going to have to look and see at any other accusations. So they're wasting their time. I actually don't post any pictures of abuse of any kind. I post truth, and we know that feminists do think that truth is abusive, but they're the only ones who think that way. And Twitter has enough sanity to see that, you know, the picture of Ray Rice beside the woman who had punched her boyfriends, it was not abuse. And if you want to know which of your images are being reported, just turn your sensitive media where a little pink box will pop up and say this could be sensitive media and when someone retweets you if that image has been reported as abuse it will come up as sensitive media even something as innocuous as a wedding cake and you'll know someone is on to you but the best thing to do is learn about the algorithms and learn how to step around them. I think that's a great idea as a matter of fact I'm going to be PMing you myself uh, to get a hold of that information because here's the deal and I don't think it should be overlooked at all. Uh, we know or we believe and we see in their actions all the time, feminists are not the sharpest pencils in the box. Uh, uh, when it comes to their ideology, they're flat stupid in many ways. But there are a lot of feminists that are very social media savvy, that are very aware of how to manipulate these systems. There is a, a link in the low bar to this video on YouTube right now that links to the latest release from Thunderfoot, who was also banned from Twitter, uh, and it appears directly by Amanda Marcotte. Uh, he had violated no rules whatsoever. He lays out his case explicitly, including screenshots from the communication from Twitter that he got. Uh, but it appears as though if you know exactly what to do, it's fairly easy to go in and get somebody's account suspended. Uh, but again, as Janet has said, there are ways around that. There's ways to circumvent uh, being brigaded and attacked that way. Uh, if you're an MRA that posts anything resembling the truth, which uh, from most MRAs I've seen that's exactly what they do, uh, you might want to make yourself aware of those. Send Janet a PM and, and find out how you get around this because, believe me, they're working hard on shutting all of us up. And it appears lately, and I guess I want your comment on this, Janet, uh, like I was saying a minute ago, it appears that they are working hardest on shutting up women. I know that there was an article in Slate naming you as one of seven women who were seeking to deny women their rights. Where the fuck they got that, I have no idea. I've never seen any evidence of anything you've ever posted. Well, you have objected to a woman's right to have a man in prison because she pointed a finger, uh, but I don't really know if that's a constitutional right or, uh, or, or from the Canadian uh, charter, I, uh, I'm not getting that, but where have you supposedly wanted women to be denied rights? Well, they, they left out one important word. I am, in fact, working to deny women their rights, but they forgot one word, soul. I am working to deny women the sole right to choose parenthood. I am working to deny women the sole right to be presumed a a custodial parent. I'm working to deny women the sole right to decide whether or not their children's genitals will be mutilated. I mean, I'm working for all of those rights. It's, that's such an interesting story with Amanda Marcotte because I came under a certain amount of criticism um, for posting uh, pod quotes and attributed them to Jessica Valente, including some quotes of hers that were real, and then some manufactured quotes. And the way Poe's Law works is that you get people who can't tell the difference. That there's such a, the, the conversation is so radicalized that when you put up something that sounds absolutely absurd, people will jump on it and take it for real. 4chan, absolutely brilliant at doing this with things like End Father's Day. And um, they are, they're just wonderful at doing that. So I came under some criticism for doing that with people saying you shouldn't be falling to their level um, it, it doesn't make us look good it's not very, it's not respectful this is not how we want to do this we want to take the higher road and fair enough those are that's valid criticism but the entire point was to get someone some social justice warrior like David Futrell to pick up those quotes and write an entire article about it of course he did 
the uh, the brigade <laughs> is. Useful the idiot, David Futrell. <laughs> He falls into traps so easily. I set one for him today. We'll see. <laughs> he's he's very 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 gullible, and he does a lot of work for me, and I really appreciate his effort. So the I predictions on Twitter might have come from Trell's followers as well. That that's another possibility. So even though people disagreed with me um, attributing false quotes in the spirit of Poe's law to Jessica Valente, it had exactly the effect I wanted. When Amanda Marcotte put me on that list, that was a vendetta. There is no way, absolutely, in, in at no part of my imagination do I imagine I am as influential as Christina Hoff Summers, as Kathy Young, as Phyllis Schlafly, as the Pollitt Chicks. She put me on there because I goaded her. I got under her skin. I pissed her off. And that was my intention. That's what I wanted. And beautifully, just beautifully, she linked to the David Boutrell articles on Jessica Valenti. <laughs> so popularizing that dumb bitch in her shirt even more. Now, I think Amanda broke the irony meter when she said I was supposedly the PR person. I mean, Amanda, you just put me on alternate and in salon. I think maybe I know how to do this public relations thing by just pissing you off. That's the level we're at. I mean, would it be nice if we could just have nice press releases issued that everyone would calmly publish? We're going to get there. We will. But we're not there right now. So what we need is, you know, aggressive, uh, skin grading, get right into them, hit their nerves, and make them publish me as one of the seven most influential women who are, you know, arguing about uh, women against feminism and who are arguing against this particular ideology. There's no way I should have been on that list. The last few just weeks, literally, have been unbelievable. Richard Dawkins retweets me. Boom. That was incredible. Um, Amanda Marcotte puts me in alternate. Salon picks it up. Now I'm on Salon. It was kind of interesting to see some of the other newspapers respond to that because they clearly had no idea who I was. They were like, oh, yes, well, we know Hoff Summers and we can dress young and then I bloom, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> but now, thank you, Amanda. They all know who I am now. And in the last, my blog has picked up um, 3,000 extra followers in the, since Amanda put that out there. I've got another extra 1,000 followers on Twitter. Um, so many things are happening right now in our culture that the whole dialogue is coming together. Women Against Feminism really didn't know that they had a lot in common with what men's rights was talking about, and now they do. And I think the exact same thing is happening with Gamergate. These guys who would have said MRA, like, what? No, what? We have nothing. Remember when 2020 tried to link you and that, that the, the harassment that was happening to Anita Sarkeesian had somehow to do with you? you know, I think a lot of gamers... That, that was had, a million hits to a voice for men. Yeah, it, it works brilliantly. But gamers who might have previously said, okay, no, we don't, we have nothing to do with the MRR, all of a sudden, they've just had this experience of getting raped by feminists who are accusing them all of being misogynist neckbeards. They've had a taste of what life will look like if these feminist overlords get their way. And it's not very pleasant. I mean, what, what, what was their feminist game? Chasing tampons around in some little crappy video game? Seriously. <laughs> Yeah, okay, social justice warrior and feminists are going to make games. Enough with well, destiny. Depression quest. Don't forget Depression Quest. That's a, probably oh. the hugest, biggest game that's come along in years. It's literally free, and they still can't get people to download it. Um, you know, one thing I will say in Marcotte's defense, uh, that getting under her skin... Uh, you have to at least acknowledge that her skin, much like her personality, can be measured in microns. Uh, so it's not exactly hard to get under uh, Amanda Marcotte's skin. Uh, she is that thin skin. She's uh, probably, I think, one of the, the frontiers women of uh, victim ideology online. I want to say something else, too, you may disagree with, but I wouldn't sell yourself short. I think that your amount of influence, um, there are two communities in my mind, and I'm going to get in some trouble for saying this. It's okay. I live in trouble anyway. Um, there are 
two schools of, of men's and anti-feminism activism. There are those who sit around and pontificate and make very nice little uh, arguments and present some some facts and move on and have the backing of, of bigger organizations and then there are people who step into the real issues. Um, the, I respect in one way or another all but one of the women that, that you listed that were also listed by a, a Amanda Marcotte. Uh, but what I see the difference is where, where I don't see from any of these other women and, it's, and I think it's why your popularity is growing and why the popularity of a lot more red pill thought is growing is because we're stepping right into the middle of the real issues and the real issues are women's sole determination of reproductive rights and their control over the lives of men uh, from that point forward we're talking about women's sole determination uh, on so many things like uh, being able to make a false rape accusation with impunity. The worst they're going to get is a slap on the wrist. We don't see this taken on head on, I think, the way it should be by a lot of the more prominent women who would be considered anti feminists. And then we have some of those, and I will mention this name, though some will disagree, Phyllis Schlafly, who I think has done a lot of good anti feminist work. But and she was, but she was also the one that undermined the ERA successfully, based on the fact that women should retain privilege uh, over hardships that are that men typically uh, have always had to face on their own. I think you represent a new breed of woman. You people like Karen Strong, Allison Tiemann, are coming out in ways, and I believe that you guys are the future of the women in this movement, as opposed. Uh, to the rest, I would have put you at the top of that list. Just saying. Well, I mean, I, I have to agree with you on the Phyllis Schlafly thing. Although, uh, you know, I would love to see the ERA exactly as written. Exactly as written. Let's see the ERA made into law. And it's going to be these modern third wave feminists that will scream the loudest to shout it down. But I think it's very curious. Yeah, Gloria Steinem. And um, Karen DeCrow, uh, Warren Farrell, that group of 1970s sort of very involved in now feminists and feminist allies were very much interested in the kind of equality that we're interested in. And I find it fascinating that Gloria Steinem does have a presence on Twitter. And she will make comments on things that are going on on Twitter. But when it comes to women against feminism, she has been dead silent because I think she recognizes that what we've done is come full circle and we're back to arguing the same kinds of feminism that she was arguing in 1970 only you can't call it feminism anymore because the well is poisoned it's just it's polluted beyond all recognition and we now need our you know humanism human rights egalitarianism whatever you want to call it Feminism is gone, even though we've come back to where they originally started. And I think it's very interesting that someone like Richard Dawkins, who is taking a stand against these poisonous little vipers who call themselves feminists right now, Dawkins is taking a stand against them. He actually retweeted Christina Hoff Summers with the recommendation to his million plus followers that they need to read this woman. Um, he gets in arguments about the absurdity of what constitutes rape now. He gets in arguments, well, and he retweeted something that I had tweeted. It was actually a video of himself, which is kind of funny. <laughs> I just, I had just said I really love how Richard Dawkins takes the piss out of feminists here who prefer babble over facts. And he retweeted that, but it had the hashtag, Women Against Feminism. And Dawkins knows Twitter. He's, he gets into Twitter wars quite frequently. And he tweets frequently. I mean, he understood what he was doing. So you've got one of the, the, the smartest, most accomplished, one of the most well-known men in the world saying, all right, enough with this sexist, misogynist horseshit that's called feminism. And yes, it's feminists that are the true misogynists. They yeah. hate women. They absolutely despise women. And women are just getting sick of it. We've had enough. 
thank you. Th thanks for your support, but yeah, you can take your foot off our neck now. I've always thought it was the ultimate irony, and I've said for years that the men's movement is what feminism purported to be, but is not, and never made it to. All they did was turn into an elitist movement that infantilizes and hates women and relegates them to incompetence and to uh, the inability to take care of themselves uh, without society assigning white knights to stand guard for them. They're like little bitty babies that can't be trusted alone. They can't be trusted uh, to make sound decisions for themselves. They can't be expected to make sound decisions for yourself. Everything that you will read at A Voice for Men, I guarantee you, I can't vouch for all the comments. We get idiots that come in there just like anybody else uh, on their website. But if you read any of the pushing now 4,000 articles on A Voice for Men, you will not see one that infantilizes women or does not advocate for their equality. We just advocate for the equal responsibilities that come with it. Feminists want no part of that whatsoever. They are afraid of responsibility because they know if they have the onus put on them to be responsible for their lives, their decisions, their actions, then they can't extort money out of the society around them to take up the banner of their stupid cause. Um, and I don't think that gets really discussed enough, Janet. Uh, I don't know what feminism is anymore. We all know it's not about equality, and we all know it's about elitism. But one thing it's certainly not about is human responsibility and human rights. It's, it's totally, uh, totally against the concept of both. Oh, I agree with that. And I think I had a very interesting conversation with someone on Twitter about um, an information, a poster that someone had put up at his, his university, his campus university uh, sexual assault prevention office. And of course, it was men are all the men are all the rapists and women are all the victims and the usual blah blah blah. But we got into discussing what would happen. I mean, looking at the, the complete and utter collapse of rates of rape, of rates of domestic violence, of rates of all crimes have been declining rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. And that's because the baby boomer population is aging, and they're just getting too old for that kind of shit. So all these rates are dramatically declining. But here you have a university, campus, office, with people making a salary to discuss preventing rape. And yet... In the, what was the FBI um, report that 90% of university campuses didn't have any rapes at all? They had none to report? So what is exactly what exactly are these people doing in their campus offices to earn their salary? What they need to do is whip up rape hysteria. Otherwise, what is the point of having them there? Why are they there? They're well, just there to earn money. Don't tweet what Janet just said, you'll get banned from Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, rapes overall have plummeted in recent years. Uh, and we've seen feminist ideologues say the don't be that guy campaign was somehow responsible in the, what, the, the one or two Canadian provinces that they did it in. They said, look, we put up this campaign and there was a sharp drop in rapes. Fuckers, there was a sharp drop in rapes everywhere. In the United States, in the Canada, all over the Western world, there was a sharp drop in rapes. And these people are so intellectually sloppy and careless that they come out with something that has no causal effect whatsoever, no link whatsoever, waving a piece of paper around and, see, and says, see here, shaming all men as potential rapists is an effective rape deterrent. Ugh. My God. It's, I, I have a website that I absolutely love. It's called spuriouscorrelations.com, where this statistician just collects these crazy relationships, like declining, um, declining mayonnaise sales is correlated to like to 99% with a rise in motorcycle accidents. So promoting the sale of mayonnaise will prevent road accidents, motorcycle deaths, and it's an absolutely hysterical website. But it's one of the most common tactics for them to use, right? We're going to demonize, whip everyone up into a hysteria about domestic violence and then say, but look, it's dropping. It's dropping everywhere. 
Every crime is dropping. They're all dropping. Do nothing and it will continue to drop. And the hysteria is it's all about the money. Follow the money. That's all you have to do and then you know what's motivating these people. And by people, of course, I mean the, the actual self-identified, yes, I'm a feminist. Women and men, just common women and men, are starting to be able to see through this in a, in a really easy way. I mean, it's just so beautiful that Ray Rice has the love of his wife, the support of his wife. Do they have an admirable way of working out their issues? I don't think so. I wouldn't like that. Guess what? It's none of my business. It's their business. So they're destroying Ray Rice at exactly the same time that Hope Solo, Hope Solo, who at a family barbecue called her nephew fat and punched him and is awaiting domestic violence charges herself. She gets to be the captain. Now, feminists can, you know, spin around and do their little song and dance about why that's okay, but average people, just an average normal person can see that that's, it's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. And that's the point. They, they, they're hanging themselves. In a way, we could probably just sit back and let it go because they could hang themselves. But you know what? There are lives out there being affected right now, right now today, by some of the garbage that feminists have allowed women to get away with, have allowed the, the standards like around child custody and around rape accusations. There are people being damaged and destroyed by those right now today. So we can't afford to just say, we'll let it play out. We can't. We're going to push them off the cliff. They're running that way anyway, but you know, we'll speed them along. I'm happy to do that. And I want to give a special shout out to all the pussies at ESPN uh, on this one, because just like, uh, I mean, the commentators on ESPN are just like little puppets with with strings in the back of their necks that you pull and it says what Ray Rice did was unconscionable uh, hope beats on a minor beats on her family laughs about it on television you think anybody from ESPN is saying anything about that not a peep from any of them these people don't care about violence they care about the money and now these weak guys, uh, uh, people like Roger Goodell and others, and the owners of, um, oh, I, for, I forget even which team that Ray Rice played for, um, have terminated his career all over politics. Um, and we have do have people like Amanda Marcotte and others to thank for this mentality because they are pushing this narrative so hard and so fast. Uh, Janet, we got a comment here that from Goodfellow that I want to put up for a moment. Um, says, uh, Amanda wrote an article about me and I got about 500 subscribers in that week. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, and Janet, yum. Okay. Um, I won't disagree with any of that comment, uh, but the fact is, this is a good example. People like Amanda Marcotte, people like Jessica Valenti, go after them. Go after them as hard and heavy as you can. One, they're too weak to withstand criticism, so they freak out anytime somebody disagrees with them. Very much borderline type traits in all of these extreme feminist women. But go after them. Write another article about them. Trash them out with the truth. I don't mean to lie about them or anything like that. There's plenty that's true about Amanda Marcotte and about Jessica Valenti and about Amanda Hess and you can go right down the list and trash these people out. Get your stuff known. Submit it to ABFM. We'll run it. We don't care. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a really good thing to do because what happens, and you can even tell them, we, oh God, I wrote an article about this years ago telling them that we loved what they were doing and we knew that they were too pathological to stop. Do you think Amanda Marcotte can stop reacting to people who disagree with her or who point out her lies and, and point out her distortions? No, she can't. She's too sick. She's too fucked in the head. So is Jessica Valenti. These people can't help themselves. White knights like David Futrell can't help themselves. They don't even, Futrell doesn't even look to see if there's any truth in something. He just sees something that he de deems is usable uh, to try to attack the MRM and sticks it up there without thinking about it. He can't help it. 
that's what he does. Uh, but this is what these people are more responsible for growing the men's movement than either one of us in this conversation and, and almost anybody else I can think of. It is feminists that made the men's movement necessary and it is feminists that are helping us grow. Don't ever miss an opportunity to allow them to do what they want to do, which is to help us. Well, they do a good job. You know, interesting, um, it's talking about how Amanda Marcotte cannot help herself. She wrote an entire article. Well, first she wrote an article about home-cooked dinners are oppression for women and that they're made for ungrateful children and husbands who would rather be eating fast food anyway and we need to end the home-cooked meal. Like, charming, right? Just lovely. It's a, yes, it's a fast food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, way, way to contribute to the health of the nation there, Amanda. Where she then followed it up with another article saying, I'm turning my, I'm not reading my Twitter mentions anymore. So she admits that she obsessively reads her mentions on Twitter. You know, she'll go in and see what everyone had to say to her. And she came under so much flack and so much attack for that don't cook for your husband because it's just oppression. She got so much grief for that from just normal people saying, are you, are you nuts? Are you mad? Like, how can you, what a despicable, vile little woman you are. To, first of all, you turn, you've turned domestic labor into something that doesn't count as work. You know, all women should be out there in the labor force, chuck your kid in daycare, housewives are dumb, housewives are stupid, you're not doing anything with your life. Presumably she thinks house husbands are the same. And then she attacks the home-cooked dinner. Like that one moment in a busy family's life where they're struggling to just get that one moment together, right? Let's just be the family that Betty Friedan destroyed. That terrible oppression of having a loving family to gather together every night around the dinner table. I mean, luckily, we had Betty Friedan just end that kind of misery. And now, that one meal. It's the last, it's, it's that one moment where most families get to be a family. And here's Amanda Marcotte just shitting all over it. And she caught grief. That's unrelated to Women Against Feminism. That's unrelated to the men's rights movement. It's just the average slate reader just went to town on her for that. And that just gives me so much hope. It gives me so much, so I, I'm so happy about that. And one thing I noticed when I was reading through my articles that I'd written on my blog about Amanda Marcotte is that I do the opposite of cherry picking. You know what I do is I put the whole article up and then I take it line by line and show her everywhere that she's wrong and support that with facts and with information. And that's something that David Futrell and Amanda and Jessica Valente and all those other writers refuse to do. They cherry pick. And I set David up for a nice, a nice cherry pick opportunity today. We'll see if he takes it, because if he does, it will allow me to discuss a little bit of his unsavory past again. And I will. I will continue to take these people to town. The more they have tantrums, the more they just bring average people over to uh, the more moderate point of view, which is ours. The more they bring people over to true equality, which is us the more they bring people into a society in which your gender doesn't determine what you do with your life. You do. And as you said, that, takes, that means taking responsibility for your choices. Exactly what feminism does not want to see. And remember, folks, when, when Janet's talking about David Futrell's unsavory past, she's not kidding. Um, take a do a little Google on David Futrell and defending child porn and see what you come up with on that. But most importantly, I want everybody to remember the answer to patriarchy is happy meals. <laughs> you can end the patriarchy by filling your kids with corn syrup saturated bullshit from McDonald's. And so what if they die young? You'll be fighting the oppression. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know where they get this stuff. I mean, do they like sit around and do acid and and try to think of the weirdest fucking idea that can possibly enter their mind and say, let's end family home cooked meals? By the way, there's a few guys out there that cook too. Uh, and they sit around with their families. They sit down in the evening. That's the one time where 
working parents and uh, especially with working fathers who aren't there during the day and the children are home for school that's the time the family is together in one spot where everybody talks to each other where a sense of unity actually plays out within the family all at the same table and if that threatens you Amanda Marcotte just fuck you Oh, that's my feeling, exactly. And that was the feeling that she got from almost everyone on Twitter, to the extent that she had to turn her note, her, her mentions off. At least she didn't go as far as saying that it gave her post-traumatic stress disorder and that now she can relate to combat soldiers, like that melody. And <laughs> I forgot who that was, but yeah. yeah. I, guess. I mean, at least she didn't say that. But that came hard on the heels of that article from Kate Millett's sister. Um, oh... What is her name? I don't. It's Kate Millett's sister, though, who talked about um, joining a meeting with Kate in New York, in which they were chanting back and forth about the way to destroy the patriarchy is to destroy the nuclear family, and you destroy the nuclear family by ripping it apart and by promoting prostitution and uh, promiscuity. And it's the eeriest. It, it just gave me chills to listen to. Uh, Millet's sister described this and that's kind of I think that that's what Amanda objects to because that's the time when the families come together and it's an opportunity for the dads especially to bond really closely with their children and that's the opposite of what feminism is trying to achieve they want those families ripped apart children are the personal property of women and th that is the future that they see for us that and they're almost there that's what the shocking thing is. They've certainly had a massive, massive amount of success in destroying black communities. They're, the black nuclear family is it's an endangered, endangered species, and that hurts abs that whole entire community. And coincidentally creates a class of people that can be exploited for really cheap labor. You know, domestic labor that you might want to be able to pay really crappy wages to. Now, I never thought it was a conspiracy before. When I've written my criticisms, of, I'm like, this. I'm sure it's a coincidence. It's just a coincidence that in destroying certain communities and destroying certain communities' families, you know, they didn't really intend to do that so that they could hire the cheap labor. Then I read that stuff from Kate Millett's sister, that little chant back and forth about how to destroy, how do you destroy what you consider a patriarchy? You destroy the family. It's essentially feminists admitting that when men are in a family, in a family unit, this is when you have a safe, stable society. This is when you have a calm, controlled society. And this is what they don't want. Didn't um, the editor at New York Times come under huge fire? I mean, Washington Post, maybe? Uh, when he, George Will when he wrote that he, he took a look at the data and women and children are the safest and least likely to be assaulted when they are in a home living with their biological father that their mother is married to. That you are least likely to be injured or assaulted. And feminists are trying to destroy that. So they're, what are they saying? That they want women and children to be injured? They don't want us to be safe? Well, if they're injured, it does help the industries that they control and run. Sorry to say, can't I don't want to paint a bunch of conspiracy into that. I think some of it is just circumstances that arise naturally, but feminists have been saying since the early 70s, and we have quotes from them. If you Google hateful feminist uh, statements or hateful feminist quotes, you will see feminists going all the way back to the early 70s, late 60s, saying, that it, we must destroy the nuclear family, that that has been part of the agenda for the whole time. And whether or not it's conspiracy is up to anybody's guess, because you go back to the time of Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood. Her agenda was to wipe out the black race. She says this in those exact words, that we don't want anybody to get on to the fact, I believe the exact quote, that we want to exterminate the Negro. That's what her agenda was in setting up Planned Parenthood. Um, to think that these people have good intent uh, when they're talking about destroying the nuclear family, 
which has been, you know, look, I'm all for men going their own way, especially in 2014. Uh, that, that has to be a viable option for them. But I don't think any reasonable person can deny that the nuclear family carried the advance of Western civilization for a long, long time. Uh, it was a very important part of our history. Now it has been destroyed. All those things that Janet listed out about destruction of the nuclear family, prostitution, all these other things, well, guess what? They all happen to be things that are happening and flourishing right now um, as though according to plan. So I don't know if I'm buying that there was no conspiracy. I think that there have been people out to get the family and that they have succeeded. Well, I would, I would say one of the things that we hear the most on Women Against Feminism on the hashtag on Twitter is you just don't know what feminism means. Yeah, right, okay. You need a dictionary. Yeah, my problem is I don't understand the dictionary definition. But the, when you talk to these women, engage them a little bit, and ask them questions like, do you think men should have reproductive rights? They will say things like, well, you know, maybe. Maybe they should. Should men have birth control options? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, I totally believe in shared parenting. Oh, I don't think that men should hit women. So you have what I think... The small group that defines itself as feminist, which is only 20% at maximum, one in five at best, will self-identify as a feminist. Of that small 20%, I honestly think that the vast majority of them are moderates, but they're silent. They're the silent majority, and they have let these radical feminists like Valente, like Marcotte, like Hess, they have let them take control of the narrative. And the narrative that the rad femmes are pushing is the destruction of the nuclear society. Uh, yeah, the nuclear family. They're pushing that. That fem femitheist, femitheist woman who has a, a plan that she's run by geneticists, apparently, on how to reduce the male population by 90%. I mean, that kind of craziness, those are the voices that the moderate feminists are allowing to speak. They're the ones and they're not challenging them. And that is the biggest, that's why they're dead. I, I honestly don't think that the average feminist, woman who identifies as feminist or male who identifies as feminist, has a plausible argument to make against shared parenting. I've yet to see one on my Twitter feed that said, yeah, no, 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 there should never be shared parenting. And yet you read the now position statement, which by the way has disappeared. It's gone. Now took it down. That has happened in the last past, just days. We can measure that in days. Now took down its position statement on shared parenting. But I recall reading it, and it's on other people's blogs in Reproduced, and their logic behind opposing shared parenting is that Shared parenting is simply a way for men to avoid paying child support, and it's a way for men to control women once women have broken apart the marriage. At no point will they acknowledge that shared parenting is about, A, the children's right to a meaningful, equal relationship with both their mom and dad, and at no point will they say that men are equally qualified to care for small children after divorce. They literally oppose equality. Institutional feminism literally opposes equality because they define men as abusers, and that's it. You'll get and the you same thing from the American Men's Study Asso Studies Association headed by Robert Keasley, people like Michael Kimmel, who refer to fathers' rights advocates, people that are pushing for shared parenting, as an abuser's lobby saying, and I quote from their website, the only reason that men want equal access to their children is so they can abuse them. <gasps> that just leaves me speechless. That's it, it, yeah, it is absolutely that is the the the, the mo of these people. Paint all men as abusers. Uh, push for support laws that promote elitism, superiority, and oppression. Yes, I will call it oppression. It is oppression. And flying the banner of equality. Somebody here, and I don't want to ignore them, um, just wanted to say a shout out to the slime pit. Um, I want to honor that uh, because 
they're really good buddies with Amanda Marcotte too. Um, not nah. uh, just just kidding. Uh, so, but I wanted to put that up there. A guy felt like he wanted to comment on it. But anyway, okay, let's see. We're running uh, fairly close to our time in here. Um, what's the future? I want to know. And I think a lot of people want to know again. I think you're probably a lot more influ influential and popular than you think. What are your plans for the future? What are you going to be doing? How are you going to be fucking their shit up, judgy bitch? Well, let me tell you. I am going to launch a television station of my own. I'm launching a YouTube channel. JBTV is what I'm calling it. It's going to be JBTV. What I'm going to do is there's over 500 um, posts on my blog. So that's that's like your 4,000 posts. Trying to find anything on A Voice for Men if you don't know the exact title, like you just want an article about rape that you saw a couple months ago, it's really, really difficult. That's not a criticism. That's just because there's so much material. It's hard to go through. And I, I would... My plan is to take, it was originally, before we had this conversation, my plan was to take my most popular articles and read them out in my broadcast and add my some new commentary to them, um, especially articles that were published some time ago. But now I'm thinking maybe what I want to do is take articles in which I have not cherry-picked feminists, in which I have taken their entire article and carefully laid out what's wrong with them. But one way or another, I'm going to have the first 10 episodes up on YouTube, and I'll be airing one, you know, every couple days for 10 days, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. If there's a significant level of interest in hearing, uh, listening to me rather than reading my blog, then that might be the newer way that I go. I'm sort of following the steps of Thunderfoot and Amazing Atheist that sometimes just sitting down to watch someone talk about an issue is uh, more interesting and, and fits better into your into a busy person's life and creating podcasts. So it's a whole new area of the internet that I'm going to be exploring, and I'm hoping I'm hoping that I pick up some really good um, some really good numbers. Of course, I do intend to monetize those sites. I mean, I'm not just interested in getting the word out there. I'm also interested in turning some of the interest in our movement into um, some actual money because what we have in front of us, where we're going, where we're going into the future is very frightening. Think of the costs involved in mounting a legal challenge against, you know, the, the or trying to get through a law for the presumption of shared parenting. Change the law, state by state by state. We're talking about big money. What we need to do right now, we're at consciousness raising, we need we need to grow our base and we need our base to start supporting us in very small ways. A huge number of people giving us small donations or watching an ad for us on YouTube or through um, Patreon, paying a small subscription. A large number of people making that small contribution will allow us to begin the really hard work of addressing how the laws are going to change. So unlike Anita Sarkeesian, any money that comes into my, that, that is generated out of my work on YouTube, any work that I'm doing on Patreon, that money will be paid directly into a Voice for Men's PayPal account. And until we're talking dump trucks of money, it will always be paid into a Voice for Men PayPal. Anything you do to support JBTV goes directly back to supporting the issues that are affecting men and boys. And when there are issues that affect men and boys, Women and girls are affected too. Well, thank you so much for that, JB. That's a very encouraging. I want you to know that I'm going to be starting a petition uh, immediately after this program that one of your videos be suppose we have a stupid whore registry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that to be one that I read. Yeah, the, one of the earliest ones. Well, that one generated quite a lot of interest. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, that was a barn burner of, a, of an article. Um, if you haven't read it, go to judgybits.com and read it now. Um, I was kidding about the petition. I hope that's one of the ones you might select, uh, mainly because it's so damn funny and so damn true. Um, uh, as 
Well, uh, that wraps it up for us. Uh, Janet, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, maybe we should do something like this a little more often uh, than we have been. Uh, you're always great to speak with. It, uh, we got a nice crowd in today. Sorry, uh, thank you everybody for showing up and watching. I'm sorry I did not get to all your comments. Uh, but uh, we will see you next time right here. So take care, all. Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, be sure to tune in Monday for uh, the Intelligence Report uh, with Dean Esme, myself, and Dr. Tara Palmatier, then going mental on Wednesday, and we have other surprises coming up, like Mainstream Media with Warren Farrell on Thursday. You guys.